Hello, I'm Reverend Debbie Spangler from First Presbyterian Church in Denton, Texas, and I hope that you're having a good evening, a happy Valentine's Day, and a blessed Ash Wednesday. We were not able to do our live stream, our service tonight. Um, there were some difficulties, so what I'm going to do is just do a little bit, a short little bit of the service um, with the meditation, the readings, so that you will at least get some of it. And you can already see we've had the service because, well, I have my cross. You know, I was talking today, um, well, of course, on Facebook came across the meme that said there is Lent in Valentine, Valentine. But also, they said, well, isn't Ash Wednesday sort of a Catholic um, observance? And I'm going, no, really, it is or should be a universal observance. Because really what we're doing is we're remembering that God knows us from the beginning of our lives to the end of our lives. He knows us before we were born. He knows all throughout our life. He knows us when our when we will die, but he wants us to live with him forever. And the purpose of this remembrance is us for us to remember that our time here on earth is finite. It will end. And we cannot ever wait to come and return to him. That when we repent, we need to do it right away. And the readings for tonight are pretty much standard. Ash Wednesday readings, um, but they all talk about the heart, and so it's perfectly good for a Valentine's Day to talk about these things. It's not as weird as you might think it is. All right, we began with a call to worship, of course, and the prayers of the people, but I'm just going to launch into the reading itself. And I'm going to do it a little bit differently than I did in the service, because after each part, I'm going to talk about it. The first reading, and we did it responsibly tonight, was Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me. And will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin and I shall be pure. Wash me and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness, O God of my salvation. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a repentant spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. All right, let's take a look at this for a few minutes. Now, in this psalm, the word heart appears twice. Well, actually three times in some translations, but I'm only going to use two. In verse 10, it says, 
Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Because we are born as sinners. And verse 5 of that reminds us that we were sinful from the time we were conceived. Our natural inclination is to please ourselves rather than God. And David, who wrote this psalm, followed that inclination when he took Bathsheba, who was another man's wife. And we, we follow it when we sin in any way. But, like David, we must ask God to cleanse us from within. Cleansing our hearts and spirits for new thoughts and desires because right conduct can only come from a clean heart and a spirit and then the last verse says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart O oh God you will not despise God wants a broken spirit a humble spirit an obedient spirit, a repentant spirit. We can't please God by outward actions if our inward heart and attitude are not right. And when we sin, we must ask ourselves, are we sorry for sinning? Do we genuinely intend to stop sinning? God is pleased with this kind of humility. In the Bible, the heart is considered the seat of life and strength, and hence it means mind and soul and spirit, one's entire emotional nature and understanding. The heart represents the wisdom of feeling, whereas the head is the wisdom of reason. Now let's take a look at the next passage. This is from Joel, chapter 2. And there's several verses in here we're going to read. Verses 1 and 2 say, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. And then in verses 12 to 17, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Well, in our Joel passage, the Lord God declares that we are to return to him with all our heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. We are to rend our hearts and not our garments. God was telling the people to return to him while there was still time before his judgment. I mean, just like he sent Jonah to Nineveh to proclaim to them, repent and turn to God, and he would not visit his judgment upon them, and they did. Here, it's very similar. Joel was giving God's word, telling them to repent, and he was telling them, repent while you still can. And it is time for us, too. To return to God. We do not know when our lives will end. We must trust and obey God now while we can. And we should let nothing hold us back. And deep remorse was often shown in those days by tearing one's clothes or rending them. 
And as we heard in David's psalm, God doesn't want just an outward display without inward repentance. Now, the third reading for tonight is from the Gospel. This is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, and, and there's separate verses in here we're reading. The first one is 1 through 6. And this is, starts off talking about giving alms. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Then we pick up again with verses 16 to 21. When you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. All right, let's look at this one. Matthew's gospel records Jesus' words regarding giving alms, prayer, fasting. And we do all these things, or should be doing them, with the right attitude and for the right reasons. In verse 21, we're reminded that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Storing up treasure in heaven is accomplished by all acts of obedience to God. Sometimes there's a sense in which giving our money to God's work is like investing in heaven. But our intention should be to seek the fulfillment of God's purposes in all we do, not merely what we do with our money. What we value most in life is our treasure. And is it God? We're going to take a moment now to consider St. Valentine's. Since it is St. Valentine's Day, and I do have a purpose for this that I'll get to in a minute. In early Christian history, there were several martyrs named Valentine. Scholars still debate the true identity of the St. Valentine who inspired the holiday. According to one story, he was a priest imprisoned and persecuted for his faith. The story goes on to say that he was imprisoned for marrying off soldiers of the Roman army. At that time, married soldiers could avoid the call for military service during wartime. Valentine may have viewed that marrying off soldiers was a way to keep them from dying while serving a pagan power, Rome. If married men, though, avoided military duty, then military numbers would plummet, and that was something Emperor Claudius II would not care for. 
Now, the emperor had Valentine imprisoned for subversion. But there is a story that says that Valentine was on good terms with Claudius II until he attempted to persuade the emperor about the validity of Jesus Christ. And the emperor got tired of this, so he sentenced him to death unless he abandoned the faith, um, which, of course, Valentine did not. Another story attributed to Valentine is that while in prison, Valentine developed a close relationship with the jailer's daughter, more like a mentor relationship, but they came friends. But when he knew he was going to be executed, he wrote a farewell letter and, yes, signed it from your Valentine. He was executed on February 14th in the year 269 A.D., and while the holiday's origins are rooted in Christian tradition and martyrdom, it has become a secular celebration of love and friendship. But like I said, I have a reason for this. I'm going to read to you now the last reading, the New Testament reading. And this one is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20b to verse 10 in chapter 6. It's not that long. He's writing, he says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path, so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. These are the words of our Lord. Okay. The imprisonment and hardships of Paul and his writing to the church was out of love. And it's kind of similar to, Paul, to Valentine's story. What Valentine did in befriending the jailer's daughter, in thinking of the lives of these men under his care as a, as a priest. All of these things. And in, in doing what he felt was being obedient to God is very similar to what Paul is talking about here. Now, the word heart is not found in Paul's letter. But the word love is. And in the following three verses from what I read, he does mention hearts. And this is what he says. He says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. Well, Paul, as a servant of God, was steadfast in his obedience to God, even through hardships and troubles and beatings and imprisonments, riots, 
in hard work, in hunger, but also in his patience and kindness and in his sincere love. Open, we opened wide our hearts to you, he says, and not withholding our affection from you meant that Paul had told the Corinthian that his true feelings for them, revealing how much he loved them. The tri Corinthians were acting as if he were very cold to them, but what Paul was explaining that his harsh words came from his heart out of his love for them. And sometimes love is not gentle. Sometimes it must be tough. Well, we know this Lenten season is a time to reflect on the state of our hearts and our attitudes toward God, toward others, toward ourselves. Ask God to cleanse your heart and to put a new and right spirit within you. Return to God with all your heart. Remember that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And open wide your heart. I cannot pass this reading up on this night without reading these verses from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. After that, and we did some more, a little bit of reading, we did the imposition of ashes with the words, dust you are, to dust you will return. Now I'm going to give the charge, which is to go in peace and serve the Lord. And the benediction, may the God of peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, your spirit, your body, your soul free from fault at the coming of our Lord. Amen. Have a blessed night and a blessed Lenten season. Thank <laughs> you.